Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, Performance Manager Applications for Concerts and Festivals, presented by Juan Suthel. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. Just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions to the presenter and they'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. This webinar is also being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control, and we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Session Workshop Series on pro.harman.com. We're adding new sessions daily and have over 20 sessions scheduled for July and August, so watch for those on the calendar. And now I'd like to introduce you to Juan Suthil, the presenter for today's webinar. Juan began his career as an audio engineer in 2000, mixing front of house and designing JBL sound systems for music festivals and tours. This evolved into conducting JBL Vertec and VTX training sessions for Harman over the last 14 years. Now I'll pass it over to you, Juan. Thank you, Laura, and welcome everybody to this VTX Solutions for Concert Audio webinar. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedules to be with us. Like Laura said, my name is Juan. And just a little bit of background about me. I'm an audio engineer. I've been an audio engineer since the year 2000. Uh, currently, I am the front of house and systems engineer for a company called NZ Sound Reinforcement here in New Zealand. I'm also a Harman Tour Sound ambassador and I am certified, I'm a certified VTX trainer for Harman. I've done quite a few medium to large scale indoor and outdoor uh, concerts uh, in various arenas and stadiums. And over the last 18 years, I've been, I've been doing a lot of designs and installations with uh, Vertec and VTX products. And my favorite speaker at the moment is the uh, VTX A12. So, the festival that we are going to look at today is a show called Bay Dreams. This is one of New Zealand's biggest music festivals um, and there's a lot of local and international artists that we host on that stage. We've got about 30,000 people at that show and in terms of music genres, it's from EDM right through to uh, pop, pop music. And this also is a annual event. So it happens every single year, which is over New Year's basically. This is happening in the Trust Power Stadium. And particularly our stage is located just outside the stadium in the outdoor parking, parking area. So we erect a large semi-permanent SCAF stage and roof structure system for that. And so, we, so we've got an audience area about 80 meters uh, deep and 50 meters wide that we need to, to cover. So this is just a top view of how the stage and front of house area looks, looks like. Um, and as you can see, we've got the, the, the main PA that is basically sitting right there. And then we've got some A8s as outfalls for this particular show. The audience is a very young and dynamic audience. And so is the music. It's super dynamic. Um, it's the two day festival for us on that stage. And it's a 10 to 12 hour long show with the system basically running at full tilt um, the whole time. Um, air temperature varies from 21 to 35 degrees Celsius, which is quite a big, quite a big variance uh, to, to, to cover. And it's a day and night show, obviously. So this is what the audio system looks like, the main audio system. So we've got the VTX A12 system as a main as a main system with VTX A8 as outfalls. And then we've got a, a big subwoofer array of VTX G28. And then on top of every single VTX G28 cluster, we've got a single F12 VTX F12 on top of that just to fill in 
um, the very first couple of rows basically. So this is how it looks like. So this gives us a very good picture of, um, of the entire system. And the very interesting fact about this particular show, it, the, the set design changes every single year. So we don't have the same design. But this particular year, this, it was really interesting. We had to fly a PA inside that cavity, basically, and that was a very um, challenging part of the whole show. And the other challenging part was we had a very wide area to cover. So the outfalls were quite wide from out from the, from the, main, from the main PA. And then, like I said, we had 24 G28s and the F12s sitting right there. I'll show you guys some pictures as we, as we carry on. So the main system was 18 A12s and six A12Ws. So effectively we had 12 boxes of A12 aside, and then we had 16 A8s, meaning eight per cluster aside. The A12 is a full range three-way system, as many of you know. The A8 is a bi-amplified speaker. And like I said before, there was a significant distance between the main system and the outfall system. And this posed certain challenges for us. And we, we in, with the design, we, because of the front falls we had and because of the A12 wide boxes we had at the bottom of the array, we were able to seamlessly cover that, that, inf that, that front section basically of the, of the system. So the combination of the A12 wide, the 110 degree A8 and the F12 front fold just made that coverage area just seamlessly. The system also had to be super clear and the lowing had to be extremely big. Um, just for the type of festival and music uh, that was that we are we're putting through the uh, system. So this is a quite a nice close shot of the stage, and yeah, as you can see, subs down the bottom here. Um, it it was a really good a really good setup for us. You guys can see in the picture we've got some M22 monitors there as well. So I'll get to that a little bit later, just to show you what we did there. Yeah, so this is just another picture of what my sub configuration looked like with the uh, F12s. This is a very, very neat setup. It just works well every single time. So just on the VTX G28, um, like I mentioned before, the subs had to be very powerful. The frequency response was was a key factor for us um, because of the EDM uh, music that we played through the uh, through the system. Together with that, the sub coverage was very important as well because we had a 50 meter wide area to cover, which might not see, seem very large, but it, it it's a pretty wide area to cover. So we obviously want, wanted to make sure that we get equal impact, um, you know, from the center right down to the edges of the um, of the listening areas. Um, we also had a couple bands play there, so I particularly deployed a horizontal cardioid with EDS array, uh, and that just worked again pretty pretty well. Front full system, like I said, is the VTX F12s. It's a bi amplified system, and we had eight of them. They were driven by the Crown VREC. Uh, 4x3500 amplifiers, much like the entire system basically was powered from the same amplifier, which is a 4x3500. Um, so for the DJ fills, we had a single or two single two single B18s um, and VTX M22 monitor on each subwoofer. So we we actually strapped the um, the M22 on top of the B18 and the B18 sat on the 
on the vertical transporter. And so because we had to roll that in and out um, from, from the stage wings, basically. So that, that was a pretty good solution and it works so well. Then as a monitor system, we had M22 monitors and some M20 monitors deployed on the stage. Um, works so well. Um, it's very flexible in passive mode. Um, we just, my personal experience with these monitors um, is that it, it makes very, it's a very economical way to run the monitors basically from a, from a single uh, 35 amplifier. So yeah, that, that worked pretty well for us. In total, we used about 42 crown four by 3500s for the main system. Most of that um, were housed in V racks. So, and we, we've got a couple of, uh, we had a couple of sleeves uh, with deals and single amplifiers in there. This was a very powerful and economical um, system for us. We also deployed a AES and analog signal input solution from the front of house consoles. And I used V drive to distribute signal between all of the amplifiers basically, except um, the monitor land, which uh, operated basically on its, on its own. And the system uh, ran on V drive as my highest priority um, audio signal. And I had a full analog backup as well. Like I said yesterday, I just wanted to show you guys um, a little bit more about the V drive solution and the long and the short of it is on a cat five cable we've got two pairs um, of cable that we don't utilize and we actually utilize that for the AES one and two and AES three and four signal as you can see on this little chart here um, and basically it's as easy as plugging in your AES three signal from the source and then you link up all of your VRACs with um, with cat five um, cable and you know out and into the next rack and everything was powered that way so this little picture down the right hand side of your screen this is how a 4x35 v-rack um, selector on the v-drive looks um, you've got a couple of selections there so you need to just be careful how you utilize that um, so yeah. Yeah. So again, this is the um, just an overview of what we used um, in this particular show. This was my entire design from from a front of house control perspective. Um, we had a couple of consoles at front of house and a side main sidecar um, console, and we I basically ran all of my analog backups through my sidecar via my Soundcraft VI stage box, just as a backup solution. But my main audio ran through a, a third party controller and basically distributed that uh, to the first VRAC and then the rest of it was done via V drive, uh, essentially. And I had a couple of computers at, at front of ours, obviously one for performance manager, one for the third party controller. And then uh, what you don't see here is my smart rig uh, setup, which I had a separate computer again for, for that. So let's jump to my performance manager file. So, in essence, this is what my performance manager file looks uh, look look like. Um, basically, this section below here is the just the monitor section, which I don't want to focus on too much at this point in time. So, but this was my my main setup. Um, I did have some stage fills as well, some F thirty fives on top of a vertex subwoofer each side side one one over one uh, per side basically which just filled in audio for for the stage 
So I just want to touch uh, on a couple of things um, and just carrying on from yesterday's uh, webinar. So as you can see, if I click on that and zoom to there, my container name uh, says 812 right. So I'm just going to switch over to my other camera and just show you that on the amplifier itself, you can see it, it says A12 right circuit four and then L1, L2 mids and then highs. So that's, that's basically the exact container name. So if I go and change this for a second and change that to A12 delay, let's say, and I go online, I'm just gonna mute it for now and then auto match and send this, you should see that change onto the screen. There you can see it, it changed there to, to say 812 delay. So this is just a very important part, especially when it comes to troubleshooting and you have to troubleshoot something um, on stage. Um, you need to make sure that you utilize these container names well so that uh, you can just, have a familiar system, especially if you've got two or three different people taking care of your system. So I'm just gonna change this back for, for now. Let's see. Go online again to match and send. So every time obviously that you make a change to your container names, you'll need to flash the um, amplifiers uh, again from the start, essentially. So that, that's, that's why it's good, always good to, to prepare yourself well um, beforehand um, when, when planning your show, essentially. So the next thing I want to show you uh, is, so we are online currently with, um, with this uh, system. And I don't have the, all of the V-Racks um, powered up. Obviously, I've got two racks powered up at the moment. So if we go into tune system, I just want to show you guys the calibrate array section. Uh, a little bit better. So as you can see, if, if I click on my venue and I click on my left and right, my calibrate arrays will, will open up. So if I click that again and open up the entire array, basically, if I click on the circuit, you can see these EQ changes that, that I've made. Now this is the same EQ that I have done and imported from my LAC um, basically into Performance Manager. So, and I'll, I'll go back and I'll, I'll show you guys how to, how to do that. But essentially, you guys can see this, the, the information carried over from the, the LAC and what I uh, did, did there and plan to do there onto my Performance Manager file. Another thing I wanted to say uh, about this uh, with regards to the group EQ is that once you click on your container, it says Arena 180. Within the Arena 180, we've got four clusters of, of the array. So we've got the main left, right, and then the offstage or outfall um, left and right system. If you wanna do an EQ on the arena, so meaning all four clusters, like we are in here now, um, we will, the EQ that we do here will affect the left and right and the off stage clusters as well. So if you wanna make a change, particularly to the main system, go, go and make sure you click on left and right only and make those changes accordingly. So for a second, I'm gonna go into my run show mode and show you another thing on the group EQ side pertaining to 
doing live changes. So as you can see, I, if I want to make a change, um, it takes quite a lot to move this EQ and it's obviously just to protect yourself from making massive drastic changes to the PA once it's um, in live mode, basically. So it's, there's nothing wrong with performance manager at this point. It's just a, a safeguard for you to, to use. So next up, I want to show you the, and clarify just the AES status a little bit. So the AES status, um, what this means is, as you can see, I have selected, um, or I've got AES uh, lock on, on these circuits because I've got these amplifiers um, live at the moment. So that means that I'm getting a lock, an AES signal lock or clock lock fr from the console, from the front of our console uh, to this. And hence this is obviously red because um, we don't have these other amplifiers on at the moment. So just to clarify again what that, what that means, um, and it's, that will turn as, as soon as you've got lock on every single element of your, of your um, show, of your system, that will turn green, essentially. And your system health will then also be restored and that will be green as well. And the reason why uh, that is red is just because we don't have AES lock at this point in time. If we quickly go back to this device view, I want to show you. So this little device view section here, if I click on that and I open up this rack, I want to show you, um, basically this is the overview of of the um, of that specific V rack, what I need to do quickly is I need to mute unprotect. I need to make my venue live. You guys can unfortunately not hear anything, but uh, my A12 system is running here at the back with my G28 uh, setup. So let me just bump up the music a little bit, and as you can see, this is just the overview of the entire VRAC. So you can see the meters, um, the inputs, the outputs, and again, just want to caution you um, to use this and go in here just as a, um, as a tool to troubleshoot, basically, and to view something specifically on a VRAC or, or on a particular amplifier. While we are here, I want to show you um, again. I, I, I um, you have to trust me on this. Um, I'm just going to go into run show mode, and I want to switch between my main, my main backup uh, session or my my main AES signal and my backup analog session. Uh, the music just dipped away there for now. So currently I am on my AES signal. If I activate my backup signal here quickly, as soon as I stop or I cut the music or something happens to that particular signal on the uh, main, on the main AES, you can see um, that the the analog backup takes over immediately essentially so it's a seamless transition between the aes and the analog backup so i'm going to switch back to my aes as you can see different source coming in so yeah so while we are in this mode again like I said yesterday, I'm, I get into the habit of monitoring um, and flipping between circuit meters and system meters 
frequently throughout the show just to make sure that um, I get input signal and output signal basically um, to my to every element of my of my system essentially um, because if I if I stay in system on system meters I won't be able to potentially see an issue arise uh, if any so 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 yeah one thing I also uh, utilize is that uh, this section as well the the loading impedance section um, and then circuit AC again is something I just go and check every now and again to make sure our voltage is all good so that is my performance manager file I'm going to quickly exit my show and just show you guys how I loaded up my files so if I completely go out of my design mode quickly I want to show you what I do and how I load, loaded this up so if I zoom in on that so if I say add speakers go there again just click there so if I wanted to go and upload my file which I did obviously previously um, I can just go to my LAC file which I created right there and we'll, we'll look at LAC now um, briefly so if I hit open my my file will actually load up and the same goes for my outfall system um, I've loaded that already um, we looked at importing subwoofers yesterday so as you can see I imported my my subwoofer array directly from from uh, my file I'm imported my file from my line array calculator so very effective very easy and let's go online because I want to show you guys um, just something on the uh, delay settings of the subwoofers because I deployed EDS as well I was going to say receive um, going to quickly go run my show and go to delay settings so if I zoom in I might not let's quickly zoom in so as you can see I've got some predefined delay times set in here but this carried over from my LAC file which I'm going to quickly hop to so let me just open up my Bay Dreams G28 so as you can see those delay times um, I hope you guys can see that um, those delay times carried over to my to my performance manager file here so what I do if I need to phase align my subs to my um, mid eye boxes I then generally use that to make you know changes to the entire array so let's say that might end up at seven milliseconds you you guys can see that that changes to all of the um, containers in the in the venue basically so pretty pretty neat pretty easy so let's zoom out here for now by the way if you guys have any questions uh, Rahul and Nick is in the background uh, if you guys have any questions um, just uh, fire away and uh, they will answer that in the meantime so this is this is just a basic I mean this is an overview of what um, what I did there's obviously so so many elements 
involved involved in this. Um, so let's quickly have a look at what I did for my subwoofer um, design. So I had a one meter edge to edge, so meaning there to there uh, distance between my subwoofers. Um, so I, if I hit calculate there, this is my subwoofer response um, I had. And as you can see, and like I mentioned, I had to make sure that we had a proper coverage between, you know, the center of the venue to all the way to the, to the outskirts of the, um, the edges of the venue that we had to cover. And with this um, subarray deployment and with uh, utilizing EDS, and a cardioid um, combination, it kept my stage clear, um, and it I had a nice, uh, nice good coverage area for for my for my um, listening plane. So this was the G two N eight design. If I quickly hop to my A twelve design, I'm going to say no. So this is my this is my A twelve main array design um, so as you guys can see I had a pretty good average um, pretty good um, frequency response between the front and the back um, I just made a if we go quickly to my venue view um, that was my front of house position which I always want to try and map out as well so not a not a massive area to cover, but essentially um, it was an 80, 85 meter area. And I did overshoot a little bit to combat um, just the, air, the the very cold air during the evenings and the night we had. So I just overthrew the, uh, the PA slightly, just so that I don't have to unnecessarily strain the HF by putting in a, uh, a steep, you know, HF, um, rise curve on my LAC, uh, on my LACP. Um, so as you can see, if I go there, it was pretty flat, but um, I obviously had, if I needed to use it, I can just effectively switch uh, that on and I could have made use of it. But for me, um, I did enough to, um, enough overthrow to, to cover what I needed to, to do uh, essentially. So if I just hop through here, um, the this circuit is my fourth circuit, which is the A12W circuit. Um, I deployed um, a little bit of um, throw distance compensation, obviously because we are so close um, to the to the front. Um, so that's basically how that looked like. Just want to pay. Uh, some attention to this area here. Um, when when I see something like this, especially if it's on all of the circuits um, throughout the the entire array, I normally um, don't do any EQ filters, particularly on the circuits, essentially because it's a global thing. So what I do is um, I do a global um, group EQ on, on the entire system. Uh, essentially, uh, if, if that, if it's a problem, um, you know, if the low mid uh, is a problem, I just apply it to all of the boxes, um, essentially. So let's quickly go and have a look at our A8 setup, say no. Obviously uh, I had a shorter, a shorter, uh, area to cover with the uh, outfall system, just at about 50 meters or so to cover. Um, but again, if you look, if if you look at my frequency response curve, my average here and my average on my A12 system, it looks very very similar, and that that makes it very easy for me as a systems engineer because I don't have to spend much time trying to voice the two systems um, so much. 
um, because of the VTX A8 and the VT, uh, VTX A812 uh, sounding so similar uh, in many respects. It saves me a bunch of time, but again, like, like we can see here, overall, we've got a bit of a low mid buildup. So um, as you can see, uh, I've already compensated a little bit for that uh, with my array size compensation. But if I take that down too, too much, um, it, it might not sound tonally um, very nice. So again, be careful um, using this. Ultimately, use your ears to, um, that will be your last determining factor um, if the system sounds good or, or not. Right, so this essentially, if I hop back to my PowerPoint, yeah. Um, like I say, uh, do you guys have any questions at this point in time? Just uh, fire away. Hey, hey Juan, uh, this is uh, Raul. How are you tonight? Very well, and you, Raul? Doing great. Hello to everybody listening. We have a lot of friends uh, all over the world listening tonight. Hey, um, some of the guys had a question regarding the G28 scheme that you're using, which is very interesting because you power your G28 with four by 3,500s. Uh, many of our clients uh, tend to use uh, one uh, uh, VREC 12,000s uh, where they use one amplifier to power two subs, putting the two drivers, the two 18s uh, of, this, of the same subwoofer onto the same channel. In your case, you're doing uh, discrete amplification S1 separate from S2. And I believe you, correct. I'm correct that you have one driver per channel of the four by 35, is that, is that correct? That is correct, yes. So um, that's the first thing I obviously go and change when I import my, my um, subwoofer array. So the first thing I do by default, um, the sub mode is parallel, um, just because um, it defaults to a VRAC 12,000. So um, I go and change this up and I wire this discreetly. So yeah, I've got, so on, a, on one amplifier, I've got two subwoofers really. So that's, that, that is for, for maximum amount of power, it just works so well. Um, just for the type of music and we do regularly here, that just works so well for us. Yeah, excellent. Then um, a minute ago, I hope that answers the question for Clark regarding the subwoofer wiring. And Clark, if, if you need more detail, please let us know. Um, also, if you go back to uh, your input priority, um, yep. it, it'd be great if you could send pink noise um, um, from your console. Online. Quickly get that online. Let's uh, activate this quick. So if we select input priority sources, yes. Right, so if you look at your input meters. Yeah, give me a second, input meters. Yeah. So you should be able to see some green lights, right? And then, it, yep. so that's going in AES right now, right? That is correct, yes. So you could actually fade out your AES and fade in your analog, I believe. That is correct. If I go and physically just mute that. Yep. My signal is just a little bit low, but um, let me quickly just bump this up for a second. So yeah, so basically I am on my analog backup. So if I switch on my AES again, just as dramatic as it will be so switch it on my AS signal is on again and now we are again there we go right so it's all yep. automatic you don't have to go switch anything I just wanted people to see the inputs uh, yep. when you're doing that it's kind of a, a very automatic and pretty pretty straightforward transition 
Uh, and seamless as well. Yeah, it's important to remember that the transition is based on the audio level threshold, not on the uh, AES sync or phase lock loop. So you could have AES lock, yes. but if the level of AES drops before a given threshold, the signal source will switch to your backup. Okay. That's it, yes. Cool. Do we have some other um, questions maybe? Uh, somebody wanted to know, um, you mentioned earlier that you were running three separate computers for your setup. I think I missed that part. Uh, so, I know you had one for yeah. Performance Manager and one for Smart. I'm not yeah. sure what the third one was for. So the third one just ran the, the third party uh, controller. So I had a third party controller um, just managing the all of the console inputs um, as oh, a, okay. it's basically was a, was a matrix matrix controller more than anything else. And I, unfortunately with that particular um, controller, I, I can't, I can't minimize the screen. So I have to run a independent uh, computer for, for that. So let's quickly, so up back there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So that's it. Um, yeah. That, that was it right there. The, uh, I really don't use smart at all, um, you know, uh, integrate that into my performance manager, especially if it's a big file, um, it kind, it's just better to run uh, things just separately. That's just me um, personally. Yeah, uh, we have discussed uh, the, the fact that, uh, you know, performance manager has integrated access control to run smart. Um, yeah. But A, we want to make sure that people who do that have gone through a smart training and B, we want to make sure that if you're doing that on the same computer or with two network computers, that your computer has plenty of RAM to do that. It's yeah. uh, it's pretty uh, RAM intensive. Yeah. Um, Clark had a question that I think Nick already answered, but it's good for people to know. Uh, they wanted to know if the V drive jump between racks, if it was a passive split or a, a reconditioned AES output, which I think they mean it's a buffered output, which it is. Which uh, it so is, yes, correct. Yeah. It is a it is a buffered output. Um, yeah. I sh uh, should have mentioned. I think it is. Yeah. yeah. So on that slide, it's a you can see it's a buffered AES um, okay. system, so it works brilliantly. Yep. Also, it's important to to check and make sure that it's properly set up that in the back on the input panel uh, of both the uh, the 4x35 VRAC and the 12K VRAC, there is a switch that has to be toggled to the right position for the AES signal to jump from one rack to the other. Uh, you could decide that you just want to send the AES to the, to the amplifiers just in that rack, or you can decide if you want Correct. to jump the AES to the next rack onto the network. So it's important that yeah, so, uh, you go through those yeah. uh, every time during, during setup. That's correct. So this on this uh, picture, which you guys can see at the moment, that's the toggle switch Raul is referring to right there. Um, you just need to make sure it's in the right position, um, ultimately. Exactly. Yeah, the output one on the right and the AES uh, in the 4x35, there is also a, a, a three position switch on the top right. Uh, so that's yes, important. Correct. There you go. Yeah. Exactly. Um, it's important for people to keep in mind that if you build your own custom Amprax, uh, the 4x35 uh, amplifiers uh, do not have loop throughs for the AES. So you got to make sure that the AES signal is properly actively distributed. Uh, that's yes. one of the key advantages of the VRAX where we provide all of the distribution as well as the ability to do uh, V drive. So just be, be cautious with that when you build your own Amprax, make sure that you have the proper AES signal distribution. Uh, Nick yes. Morton here, can I that's add something right. to that that's conversation? Right. Yeah. yeah, sure. Go for it, Nick. Um, another thing to mention about the VRAX in particular is that it is not only buffered at the output V drive position, but there is also a separate buffer that goes to the three individual amplifiers within the rack. Um, and first thing that a, a new user to a V-Rack might notice in particular with a four by 3500 is there are no actual AES XLR. It is actually delivered to the input of the amplifier through the Cat5 connection cable. Um, 
So that's another yep. thing to be said is that um, the AES is buffered at multiple positions. So we don't need to be concerned with voltage drop across multiple input stages of amplifiers, as well as continuing your AES stream to the next set of racks. Yeah, that is correct. Well, for me, um, because I just, I run backup after backup because the last thing you want is for the show to crash uh, over and above um, the main AES and the analog backup. I actually had another set of AES um, network at five cables, which it would be a physical, a physical swap over, but it's just me being, being cautious um, and making sure that the show doesn't go down at any point in time. Right. Um, we had a question for Clark, um, which is, which we sort of answered, but I think we'll, we'll provide some clarification, which is, is there a way to toggle between AES and analog? If your AES has intermittent dropouts and you want to force the analog. So Clark, it, this, the switching, the toggling back and forth is automatic, right? So once the, the level drops off of the, if your AES is your primary signal, and the level of AES drops off below threshold, the uh, amperac will automatically switch to analog, you know? So if your AES has in intermittent dropouts, my suggestion is to completely fade out the AES signal. So we always recommend yeah. having the AES source and the analog path on different outputs, uh, whether it's different matrices, different devices, different uh, processor outputs, so that you can just mute that source and that the system will automatically switch to the other source. You don't have to do anything else in Performance Manager. It will automatically switch to the backup source. Yeah, that's and why then, if, we, yep. yeah, if we go and have a look at this, my front of house control, that's why I particularly make sure that I don't run my my AES signal and analog backup through the same controller. So my analog backup physically it goes from that console into my sidecar just it's a totally different path um going into my coming from my vi stage box into my amplifiers again so yeah i'll just make sure make sure you 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 do that yeah we do the same thing with our demo systems where we have our vi outputs uh out of the stage track the mains are the aes outputs on a, tip, on a given matrix the backups is a different matrix out of the analog outputs yeah. So we can just toggle back and forth which one we're, we want to use. Um, Adrian had a question. Any chance PM would let me create my own amp rack and be able to save it? Yes. Uh, I think so that you showed that yesterday. Me, yeah, I can go. Oh, great. So um, that's not supposed to happen. Uh, sorry happen. for that. It's, win it's <laughs> it, Windows. It, 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 it's Windows, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if you guys give me a quick. Yeah, you could even open a blank PM file. Yep, let me just go. Manager. Open up my blank file quick. Well, this has happened to me uh, during a show before. I'm not sure if it's happened to anybody else before where my performance manager crashed kind of mid show. So people are obviously concerned about um, what will happen if you bring the system online again. And that's another important point. I'm not sure if it happened to you a uh, rule before. Yeah, of course. But... Uh, it's happened to me with the, you know, any windows computers. It's just yeah. important that when you go online, just push the green button and receive. Yeah, that's, that's it. it. Yeah, that's correct. I'm just going to do that for now. Uh, so, if we quickly look at this, um, I can go and click n the new button and then I can go and select how many amplifiers I want to have in my custom rack. So let's say I want, uh, let's say four amplifiers in my rack. You can choose whether it is a Crown iTech HD, meaning a 5,000, 9,000 or 12,000 or I can switch to a 4x3500. If I have a combination, perhaps I just need to deselect that and then I can go and change, change it like that. Click next, um, click next again. And now I need to assign what that amplifier is gonna be used for essentially. 
And, so, and again, this ties more to remind people of how the Amprac is wired, not necessarily. We, we all know by now that the current version of PM allows you to drag any bandpass to any M channel. So it could be it could be labeled LMH for passive, but yeah. you could drag a sub into it. Yeah. Uh, just to remind people is, how things are wired in the back. That is That is correct. So I'm just going to do this one now and just label it custom rec one, essentially. Um, well, I need to, uh, before I do that, let me just finish this. Adrian is asking that he meant to create a rack an amp rack with the amp ID. You mean to, to save the hiking it numbers, Adrian? Is that what you're saying? Or are you talking about the name of the amp rack? Because you can you can actually have a library of amp racks with different names, but not the hiking at numbers. Yeah, so I can go and duplicate this um, again. I just need to create a new one. But yeah, you can. We, there's a whole library of stuff so you can create multiple, multiple, multiple custom racks. Yeah, I think some people were asking if you can actually save the rack with specific hike unit IDs. No, uh, which you can't. No, so, you but you know, given the fact that he can click right now on hike, you know, once you select the rack yep. and select hike unit address above on the ribbon to renumber the hike unit rack is very, very fast. You don't even have to do it one at a yeah. time. You can just click on the rack uh, the and then click above on hike unit address yeah. and off you go. Yeah, quick way that I do it is just I just click on the um, actual amplifier if I need to do something very specific. So rename that 20 for whatever reason I want to do that, um, I, I can do that. Right. So if you want to show them, you can just click on the rack for a minute and then go up to hike your address and you can say 20, you know, for example, 20. an yep. increments of one and it'll just relabel the whole rack at once. That's so it. that's a very fast way to do it. You can select that you want to do them in pairs, so 2022 20, or whatever. So, yep. but no, you cannot store the rack uh, with preset hike unit numbers. What I do, um, it's not a preset. It's just a, it's a, it's just a way for me to again, visually make myself familiar. Is um, I showed that yesterday. Actually, uh, my VRAC, each and every amplifier of mine has got a set IP address and a set high unit address with its labeled on 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 the front panel of the physical amplifier in front. Um, yeah. So yeah, we have seen that a lot of stuff, that especially people station. that cross rent a lot of uh, equipment, they will actually uh, yeah. have a label on each amplifier showing the IP address and the high connect address so that they know, yeah. you know, what, what you're walking into pretty quickly. Yeah. So. Great. Uh, is there any more questions you can see? Let me look. I think some of the questions could answer. They can just be whatever is ID and say that. Yeah, Keith had a good comment. Hello, Keith. Uh, yes, you can also save the amp racks, uh, with the ID in a template that you can start with every, with every time. So yeah, we have a few a few clients that have a particular default uh, set of amp racks. Let's say you have your inventory of you know ten amp racks, and so you could have a template that has those ten amp racks in it, and then you just remove whichever amp racks you will not be using mm -hmm. at that at that event. And so you can start with that. We have seen that before. The issue comes in more when you're cross renting between companies. You know, what do you do with the IDs and whatnot? Um, I think the answers about AES redundancy got answered. So I think good stuff got taken care of. Any other questions or another section of, of the software that you would like to see? I think one thing I uh, did not mention is that my particular show, um, I for this particular show, I ran the 812 full range and uh, the subwoofers were crossed at 80 because I needed maximum, maximum low end um, because I couldn't fly subwoofers behind the main PA at all. So I was limited to that. Um, so it made uh, my phase alignment uh, just interesting and wasn't straightforward, but um, 
it's because yeah, I yeah. had a big uh, a big overlap between the uh, 12s and the uh, but the uh, and the subwoofers but um, and yeah, basically for fantastic. people not familiar with the full range preset is basically a 60 hertz preset slightly below 60 and so you're that when you run with the subs at 80 your overlap from basically 55 to 80 85 so your alignment your face alignment you have to be extremely careful to make sure that that it's correctly done otherwise you're going to have some cancellations so cautious with that Let's see, any more questions? I don't know, Laura, if you got any questions directly on your end. Uh, here, what happens when your show file gets corrupt? Well, so that's a good question. So like anything else, my advice to you is to save, 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 and keep saving. Like uh, during a, a night time, during a day, I have multiple sessions of the same file saved. From the time I begin, you know, save before tuning, save after tuning, save during sound check, save after yeah. sound check. So I usually have three or four versions of the same file. So yeah. basically that allows me at any point in time, if the file that I was running on gets corrupt, I can open another file and just go online and receive. Okay, so yeah. if let's say, for example, that from sound check to the time we started the show, we changed something, okay? When I go back to my previous file and I go online and receive, the file will auto-update from whatever is in the amplifiers. So never rely just having just one file. You should always be running and you know, have a couple of files deep to make sure that you have a, a, a way to recover. Um, so, yeah. I save every step after every step because I have found that if you use the basic three steps, save you the three. Let's see. If I use the basic three steps, save, you can miss a save. Is that correct? Yeah, at least. You should definitely save at least three times. Absolutely, yes. Okay, well, Laura, I think we're good with questions. I don't see any more questions. I don't see, let me check the chat. Okay. Chat looks good. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Um, Juan, do you want to pop up the contact information again, just in case anybody has a go. writing question? Yes. So that's Nick Morin's um, contact information on the screen. He was on moderating the questions, so he can answer any additional questions that you might have. And if you're interested in additional sessions, you can go out to pro.harman.com and check out our calendar. As I mentioned, we're adding new sessions all the time. Um, I think there will be several more added this week still for August, so check those out. And Juan, thank you again. Um, we appreciate you taking your time out two nights in a row um, to present for us. So thank you, and thank you all for attending. And thank have you, a Laura. Have a great rest of your day.